The Eastern Empire's three spies finally arrived to Tempest, and easily passed through customs, thanks to Yuki giving them guild ID cards. Though they're rendered speechless upon witnessing the earthen style food, modern bathrooms, and public open air baths. Mark lets slip they should just abandon the Empire. Shinji is nearly considering it, and Zen wouldn't disagree. The Empire is advanced enough to mimic a lot of this culture. However, Tempest allows the common folk to experience it as well. Of course, abandoning the military is essentially a death sentence. Granted, even if that wasn't the case, this town will surely be destroyed during the upcoming war. Getting back on track, they enter into the dungeon, and breeze through the first 40 floors, thanks to their video game knowledge from Earth. Roughly a week goes by, and we find the trio resting at the dungeon's inn, looking over their loot. On top of the money they've earned, they found an ordinary looking, yet very expensive weapon that has an empty slot on its hilt. Mark is also wielding a unique level axe, which they obtained by defeating the Tempest Serpent boss on floor 40. The exceptional quality makes it difficult to believe the dungeon just gives these away, and it causes the trio to worry that Tempest is far more powerful than they were led to believe. After conquering Bovix on floor 50, they find the difficulty curve is really ramping up. Due to this, Mark assumes floor 60 must be the bottom, but Shinji has heard rumors claiming it goes down to floor 100. But the trio hypes themselves up before entering the next boss's chamber. Going back a few days, you find Rimuru contemplating their information network. At the moment, they rely on physical bodies, which creates delays and can even be dangerous. To alleviate this issue, he began looking for magical solutions, and wound up creating an entirely new observation spell by reworking Megiddo. Suddenly, receiving word that a trio of unique skill-wielding newcomers just conquered floor 50, our slime bolts to the dungeon, assuming them to be eastern spies. The first thing Rimuru takes note of is their obviously Earth-style clothes, and the second is their perfectly balanced teamwork. The Brute effortlessly slays the mobs, the stealthy one uncovers all the traps, while Mr. Labcoat supports with buffs and debuffs. Shuna enters with the trio's information, followed by Rimuru declaring they've walked right into his trap. The group continues observing for three full days, where Vildora wants to know what he meant by a trap. You see, Tempest has been practicing their evacuation plan, which involves moving the entire city into the dungeon. Obviously, this is for their citizen safety, however Demon Lord Rimuru was also hoping their enemies would grow curious and investigate. Now, with their cover blown, it'd be easy to detain these spies, however the trio's success is great advertising for the dungeon. That being said, they just reached floor 60, and Rimuru isn't liking Ultimate's chances against Mark's holy axe. Inside the chamber, Alberto is warned that mistakes won't be tolerated, just as the trio enters the room. Wasting no time, Mark attacks but is blocked and cut down. Zen is stunned and hits the floor a moment later. A holy cannon is unleashed by Shinji, which is super effective against undead. Alberto shrugs it off, taking him down in a single slash as well. All the while Alderman, nor his undead dragon, moved from the throne. You see, Ramirez forgot to mention Alderman and Alberto evolved into a Death Paladin and White King, putting their power each on par with an Archdemon. Not to mention, Rimuru was completely unaware the Undead Dragon was even a thing. Then if that wasn't enough, Alderman has also gained an ability to swap the Holy and Evil attributes, making him a walking contradiction, since he's essentially a Holy Undead. A moment later, Rimuru admits he's surprised at their growth, but wonders why Alderman hasn't magically created himself a less undead body. Though apparently, he genuinely prefers the evil vibes this body radiates. Witnessing their new forms makes Rimuru wonder if they could be stronger than the Elemental Colossus. Valdora confidently declares our White King to be superior, prompting Rimuru to promote him to floor 70, while demoting the Colossus to floor 60. Receiving a thought communication, they learn Rosin's old master is from the Eastern Empire, and wishes to meet with Rimuru. Our slime assumes it's a trap. Both secretaries agree, but the mention of Ghidorah's name causes Alderman to perk up. Apparently Ghidorah is an old friend from a thousand years ago, and is actually the sorcerer who cast reincarnation magic on Alderman. Due to this revelation, Rimuru actually agrees to this meeting. Upon waking up, the trio is greeted with cheers from all the people who had been watching their descent. Agreeing to being broadcast might seem like a bad move for a spy, but Shinji believes the fame and publicity will actually act as their shield. They immediately head to an inn while discussing how that difficulty spike from floor 50 to 60 was unreal, and the boss didn't feel fair at all. Though if Tempest has that much strength guarding the dungeon, then surely something extremely important must be hidden at the bottom. In the report to Yuki, they estimate the White King to be on par with an Archdemon, and you come to find out Shinji has encountered an unbelievably powerful Archdemon once before. 
That event is infamously remembered as the Crimson Shore disaster, and Shinji recalls the demon's arrival, along with its defeat, both feeling extremely suspicious. Following this report, the group sells off their items at the guild, earning them a massive total of 300 gold coins. To put that into perspective, that's double their combined yearly salaries from the Empire. Obviously, they treat themselves to a fancy dinner, where the subject of staying here in Tempest arises once again. Technically speaking, the war hasn't started yet, so they could ask their superior to be let go. Again, they contemplate whether or not Tempest can survive a war against the Empire, but at this point, could Shinji, Mark, and Zen bring themselves to attack this city if they were ordered to? An unknown amount of time later, Ghidorah, along with the trio, bow before Demon Lord Rimuru. Wanting to ease the tension, they're offered American-style coffee, causing Ghidorah to excitedly exclaim, Rimuru must be an otherworlder. This great sorcerer reveals absolutely everything, from him seeking revenge against the church, to him only cooperating with the Empire because their goals aligned. Our slime blames Ghidorah for causing the impending war, but he denies it, stating the Empire has always been greedy for expansion. Besides, if it was up to him, the East would completely avoid the Jura Forest containing Veldora, and instead focus their efforts on negotiating with Dwargan. Rimuru is fairly confident King Gazeel already declined their deal, and is then informed that Yuki is planning a coup. Then with Alderman alive, Ghidorah no longer has any attachment to the Eastern Empire, and expresses his wish to work for Rimuru instead. With a few extra stipulations, the Demon Lord accepts him, but has an idea which involves sending him back to the East. The trio pledge their loyalty to Rimuru as well, but ask not to battle against Yuki. Now in regard to Ghidorah, he will be sent back east in an attempt to prevent this war. This plan is more than likely going to fail, so in that situation, Ghidorah is to turn their focus toward the dungeon. Not only will this help protect Tempest, but if the east is distracted, it will give Yuki time to stage his coup. A World War II pilot named Tatsuya Kondo was on a kamikaze run, when he suddenly and unexpectedly found himself in another world. Emperor Lidora was the summoner who saved his life, so Tatsuya fully dedicated himself to this man. Currently, Tatsuya is the head of the Imperial Information Bureau, and was tipped off that Ghidorah and Trio are currently investigating Tempest's dungeon. In addition, he's aware that Yuki is planning a coup, which causes him to doubt Ghidorah's allegiance as well. In another office, Caligulo, the commander of the armor division, bribed a researcher in order to get his hands on the items Ghidorah brought back from Tempest. These magic crystals are a hundred times better than the Empire's variant, and he's pissed that Ghidorah didn't share this information with him. Three magic swords were brought back as well, and after a thorough analysis, they discover these swords can be infused with magic crystals. There's also a rumor going around that three of Ghidorah's underlings died in the dungeon, but Caligulo is only concerned with the dungeon's resources. A measly demon lord is the only thing standing in his way, and you come to find out that Ghidorah once commanded his very own magic division in the military. With the Emperor in the background, the Imperial Council discusses how they will begin this war. There's a wide variety of opinions, followed by Ghidorah speaking out against it. Caligulo deems him a coward, but Ghidorah is worried their plan to control Veldora will fail. On top of that, angering a demon lord is always a bad idea, hence why they don't invade through Milam's territory. Ghidorah's suggestion is to negotiate with Dwargan, causing Gradim, the leader of the Beast Division, to exclaim Dwargan is far more dangerous than any demon lord. Restating his suggestion is to negotiate an alliance with King Gazeel. Gradim declares the Empire's power should only be used to overwhelm any and all adversaries. He states this cowardice is why Ghidorah's magic division was dismantled, though in reality the Empire's technology simply advanced too far making them unnecessary. Then adding salt to the wound, Caligulo tells the this old sorcerer his views are simply outdated. While faking anger, Ghidorah actually feels bad for these ignorant fools, and thinks about how he could care less what happens to the Empire, as long as Emperor Ladora remains safe. At the same time, Caligulo is confident the Eastern Empire's 1.1 million technologically advanced troops are nigh unstoppable when compared to the measly 400,000 troops of the West. With a glance from Ghidorah, Yuki boldly speaks up in favor of this war. Next, he reveals that Tempest is able to hide itself within the dungeon, and that Ghidorah's team was defeated at floor 60. The council is taken aback by this, and wants Yuki's division to tackle this threat. Addressing the Emperor directly, Caligulo bows, pointing out that Yuki is afraid of Veldora, and for that reason, the armor division is better suited to assault the dungeon instead. 
Not wanting to fall behind, Gradam and Yuki bow to the Emperor as well, prompting the Marshal to step forward, as her mere presence forces everyone to kneel. Declaring Veldora won't stop them, she exclaims Yuki is too soft, and asks why the Empire hasn't invaded until now. Yuki answers with they needed time to prepare, but is scolded as she deems it was because everyone was simply too afraid. Turning toward the panicking sorcerer, the marshal declares negotiations with Dwargon are obviously futile, so she wonders if he's just stupid or has turned traitor. At this moment, Ghidorah realizes that out of his numerous lifetimes, this is his first encounter with the marshal, which causes him to question who or what the emperor truly is. Caligulo is then asked for his invasion strategy, which is to lure Veldora into their two magic cancelers before bombarding him with thousands of tank shells. Deeming him worthless, she shouts the Empire's goal is to control Veldora, not destroy him, and that the Empire has been purposely awaiting his revival for that exact reason. As the entire room is filled with terror, Ghidorah comes upon a horrifying thought about the Marshal's potential identity, as he struggles to look up at this monster, who's seemingly on par with that of a true dragon. Even in the presence of the overpowering Marshal, Yuki offers up a proposal, stating they should invade along the mountain's edge. Is he stupid? That would lead them right into a pincer attack between Tempest and Dwargon, but Yuki points out that neither country is prepared for the overwhelming power of their tank division, which could lure the Demon Lord's troops into an ambush. Caligulo hates to admit it's a good idea, however he still thinks it's safer for his armored division to tackle the dungeon. Agreeing with this, the marshal gives Caligulo permission to assault Tempest, and orders Yuki's division to help the tanks attack Dwargon. Then lastly, Grodham's magical beast division will be flown around the mountain to launch a surprise attack on Inglacia. This will surely pit the Magical Beast Division against Hinata and her Crusaders. However, she fought Rimuru to a draw, meaning she must be a coward. With orders from the Marshal to begin the invasion, this room erupts with cheers, marking the end of this council, where the Emperor didn't speak a single word. Now, being forced to attack Dwargon did ruin part of Yuki's plan. However, he did successfully manipulate Caligulo just as he wanted. Yuki then asks why Ghidorah looks so serious, and is told he's never witnessed the Marshal so panicked before. It's obvious she's unbelievably powerful since Yuki's skills weren't able to get a read on her, and Ghidorah states this was the first time she's ever spoken during a meeting. Upon hearing all this, Yuki begins to suspect that she's the reason Demon Lord Gi is so wary of the East. It turns out Ghidorah truly believes the Empire will lose this war, and he openly admits he's going to flee to Tempest after one final conversation with the Emperor. Yuki declares that to be a bold betrayal, but Ghidorah means no ill will, and is just doing what he truly wants to do. Even though he's leaving, Ghidorah is still happy to help Yuki wherever he can, and with a laugh, Yuki promises to take him up on that offer. This old sorcerer is very excited to see what Yuki is planning, and this young man is well aware Ghidorah will be pissed if he kills the Emperor. While being led to the Emperor, Ghidorah stops at a cherry blossom tree, calling out to Tatsuya Kondo. He didn't actually sense his presence, but just had a feeling he would be there. Tatsuya refuses to allow Ghidorah to see the Emperor, and raises his handgun. A sharp pain permeates Ghidorah's body, but instead of a gunshot, it was a knife from behind. Tatsuya is shocked this assassin would do that, but said person simply couldn't let a traitor exist within the Empire. Feeling the poison seeping into his body, Ghidorah unleashes an already prepared spell before immediately blacking out. Rewinding time a bit, just after Ghidorah left Tempest, Rimuru goes to interrogate Ramirez. At first, she isn't willing to talk, but after having her dessert privileges threatened, she spills the beans. It turns out Hinata's paladins tried another run at the dungeon, however were unable to pass floor 80, causing Veldora to proclaim his pupil Zegion has transformed. Though it turns out the paladins were actually slaughtered on floor 79 by the lightning fast Apito. The fact he wasn't told any of this pisses Rimuru off, granted he's only upset because they had so much fun without him. Since then, the paladins have completely reset, starting at floor 1, but keep getting slaughtered and taunted by Alberto. This death paladin has even became so powerful, that he's begun training the still living, breathing paladins. With a broader overview of the dungeon, we learn the most powerful monsters inside have begun calling themselves the 10 Dungeon Marvels. Each of them wields Demon Lord level power, making our slime confident the East's armies won't be able to defeat them. Though Rimuru does ask them to go easy on the normal challengers. Next, our Demon Lord moves on to testing the magical surveillance system, and gives it the name Argos, the Eye of God. Not only can this view the entirety of Jura Forest, but it even allows him to wield Megiddo from within the safety of the dungeon. 
Back in his office, Rimuru meets with the trio, who ask for permission to work here in Tempest. Our slime happily welcomes all three, and agrees to their one condition of not forcing them to fight against the Empire. So due to their unique skills and otherworld knowledge, they begin working for Ramirez on various research projects. A few days peacefully pass, causing our slime to become concerned with the lack of communication from Ghidorah. Suddenly receiving word the old sorcerer teleported directly into the dungeon, Rimu rushes over to find out he was assassinated. Luckily, Ghidorah had already prepared a teleportation spell for this type of situation, and upon his return into the dungeon, a resurrection bracelet was able to save his life. It's obvious Ghidorah is extremely powerful, so who could have possibly been the person to assassinate him so easily? Now, the sorcerer does have an idea, but isn't confident enough to share, followed by Diablo stating a very interesting skill had to have been used in order to destroy Ghidorah's magical defenses. Well, now knowing the Empire is definitely going to invade, allows them to put their full efforts into preparing. The Orgo system is like nothing Ghidorah has ever witnessed. Honestly, this feels almost as though they're cheating. But then again, war has no rules. All that matters is being the victor. A strategy meeting is then held, with the Empire's tanks on the screen for all to see. Then if that wasn't shocking enough, the East even has flying warships as well. Thanks to Ghidorah, they know the Empire's military is roughly 1 million strong, and Rimuru gives a breakdown of their forces. Gobta, who is stationed at the border, nervously asks if his squad is expected to put their lives on the line against these tanks. Benimaru exclaims, obviously it's Gopta's job to crush them, but Rimuru reassures him there's no need to fight to the death, and is told their primary goal is just to protect the evacuating civilians. Only after evacuating all the civilians will Gopta assist with defending the Dwarven Kingdom. The Argo surveillance system has spotted infantry pushing into the forest, meaning the tanks must be a diversion. Geld is ordered to prepare for the sneak attack, and in the meantime, Moss and Soe will keep tabs on the enemy's positions. The plan is still to lure their enemies into the dungeon, however any soldiers who remain outside will be Geld and Benimaru's target. Now, being heavily outnumbered causes our slime to worry for their morale. However, all three generals cheer and reassure him nobody is scared in the slightest. Next, Rimuru calls out to the three demonesses, ordering each of them to back up an army corps. Testarossa joins Gobta, causing him to openly state her inexperience might get in his way. Gabaru welcomes Ultima with a bow, while Geld and Carrera gladly shake hands. In secret, our slime does ask the three women to keep a low profile, but honestly, he's not confident that will last long. Lastly, while the town is hiding inside the dungeon, it will be Masayuki's job to maintain public order. Ramirez and Veldora gloat this strategy is only possible thanks to them, though everyone is warned the town will be ejected from the dungeon if Veldora is somehow defeated. The thought of actually fighting has Masayuki panicking, so Rimuru wants to ask a crusader to be his advisor. Plus, he'll ask the kids to defend him. I mean, Rimuru will have Masayuki defend the children. Overall, our slime is confident in their defense. However, he mustn't forget that someone in the Empire has killed him once before. The Marshal verifies Emperor Lodora is awake before reporting they will be commencing the attack, even though Ghidorah was strongly against this. They're both well aware conventional weaponry is absolutely useless against Veldora, but they have to attack since that was Ludora's agreement with Gi. It turns out this monstrous woman is the true dragon, Velgrind, which makes Veldora her younger brother. She's very confident they will win and thus prove Ludora to be the world's leader, though she finds it odd that her little bro isn't causing a ruckus, which makes her suspect that Veldora hasn't fully revived. It's then revealed that everything that happens in this world is just one big wager between Ludora and Gi. It's not a joke to call the world their literal game board, and its inhabitants their pawns. The objective is to capture your opponent's territory, and for a very long time, it's been more or less a stalemate. Of course, Veldora and the Primordials are essentially wildcards, each of which are believed to be antagonistic toward the West. It's true Luminous united the West under one religion, but Ludora equally united the East through sheer force. Though with Granville and Cronoa both vanquished, the scales have tipped into the East's favor, basically laying victory within the palm of their hand. Velgrind wants to know how Ludora is feeling, as his ultimate skill, Armageddon, can only be activated under very specific conditions. This is the true reason as to why the East has been waiting to invade, though controlling Veldora with his Regalia Dominion skill is a welcomed addition. She worries for Ladora's health, but he cuts her off, deeming his body merely inconvenient. Reincarnating himself time and time again has gradually worn down his soul, as each offspring gains all of his memories and abilities. Since this version of Ladora has no son, he's retained 100% of his power, though the mental strain is definitely taking its toll. 
Velgrind compassionately asks how much longer he can last, followed by Lidora declaring he will rule over this world. He doesn't think there's any need for Velgrind to look so sad, and she vows to kill anyone who dares block his path. Thus, the following day, the Empire begins marching. Did you know everybody on screen right now was able to watch this video early? Ritsuki, Bot Bomb, Fielding Featherstun, SimpTech101, and Shadow. Thank you so much to each of you for choosing to support me on Patreon.